Our morning text is the last book of the Bible, Revelation chapter 14. Revelation chapter 14, verses 1 through 6. And God willing, I will take up the second half of the chapter during the second hour. But for this morning, we will concentrate on the first six verses before we go to the Lord's table. Hear the word of the Lord. Then I looked, and behold, on Mount Zion stood the Lamb, and with him 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven like the roar of many waters and like the sound of loud thunder. The voice I heard was like the sound of harpists playing on their harps. And they were singing a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and before the elders. No one could learn that song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. It is these who have not defiled themselves with women, for they are virgins. It is these who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. These have been redeemed from mankind as first fruits for God and the Lamb. And in their mouth no lie was found, for they are blameless. Let us pray. Father, as we briefly look at this passage, I pray that you will imprint it upon our hearts, that we will be strengthened by your grace, that we will hear the voice of our shepherd speaking to us, assuring us that we belong to an eternal kingdom and that we have an unchangeable love in Christ. Father, I pray that if there are those who are unconverted, may they give consideration for these words, and may you turn the hearts of people to yourself in faith. And as for me, O Lord, I can only ask that you help and strengthen me and that I not say something that is amiss. I pray that we will all be bound to the truth and never bow to the deceit and lies of Satan. Help us never to add or take away from your word. Strengthen us before we go to the table, and then I think of that table set before us where our Lord is present by the Spirit. Elevate our hearts to him in heaven and be assure, assuring us that he also comes to us. Feed us, I pray, through Christ. Amen. I want just for a few moments to concentrate on these first six verses, and hopefully they will lead us to the table where we will consider the sacrifice of our Lord and the hope of his coming again. The book of Revelation begins in this way. It tells us that God is speaking. He is revealing something about his Son. He is showing his servants what must take place, and immediately the book of Revelation begins to describe Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is a faithful witness. He has come to speak to us about the truth of God. He does not lie. Moreover, he comes to us as the firstborn from the dead. And in him we are brought out of spiritual death and are promised our physical resurrection on the last day. Again, we are told at the beginning of the book of Revelation that he is the king over, the ruler over the kings of the earth. And it's at times like this that we need that message very clearly. There is one who has assumed control over the universe, 
over the flow of human history, and there is one who stoops to redeem his people, because the text goes on to say, and he loves us, referring to the elect of God, and he purchased us, or he has bought us and frees us from our sins, brought us into a kingdom that is indestructible so that we may serve him with our lives, and in the end, it says, we hope for his coming. He will come on clouds full of glory. And that message about Christ, God's visitation with us, circulated throughout the nations very early on and very quickly. And so Revelation is dealing with churches that have heard this message. They have believed the gospel by the grace of God. And these churches are scattered throughout what is now modern day Turkey. Chapter two lists seven of those churches. And you think of the glory given to them in the gospel. They are delivered from the stranglehold of Satan and they are put into the loving and caring and strong arms of Jesus Christ. But that does not mean for one moment that they are free from opposition or struggle of faith. And so the book of Revelation begins to tell us that there is an enemy that has come. He has caused all sorts of havoc at the very beginning of history, and he continues to plague the church. And you move from chapter 1 and that glorious introduction to chapter 12, and you see that the promise of God to bring about a redemption, a redeemer, cannot be stymied, it will not be stopped, but there is great opposition. And that child, Christ, is born according to chapter 12. Satan cannot take him and destroy him, but rather he is lifted up into heaven where he rules the nations with a rod of iron. And in his elevation, in his ascension into the presence of God where he rules, there can be no place for Satan and in symbolic language, beautiful pictures, we are told that Satan is thrown down upon the earth in a rage. He has lost the battle, but he, as a defeated foe, is thrashing about. And at the end of chapter 12, we read two interesting verbs. The dragon, the Satan, goes after the children of God, and it says he makes war against them. And it says he pursues or chases them. And that is the enemy that the book of Revelation unveils for us as well. And we are brought into an atmosphere of tribulation. The church has always been the suffering church. The church has been forewarned by the Lord himself. If they rejected me, they will reject you. If they hated me, they will be intolerable towards you. But there is a, another word that penetrates the book of Revelation. There's opposition but children of God, by the grace of God, endure to the end. Keep going. Keep on. Do not flag or give up, because you are in the hands of a faithful, victorious Savior. Christ has overcome the enemy himself, and it is easy for us when we are facing opposition to develop, I think, an Elijah complex where we cry out, oh, we're the only ones left. But the Lord, Lord's word comes back and says, I have 7,000 others that have not bowed the knee to Baal. And the book of Revelation is saying, 
All of God's children from beginning to end will be collected by the grace of God. They have not bowed the knee to Baal. By Christ they share his victory. And so we come to the text. And I only have two points. So I'll try to be brief. The first is the text is drawing us to consider Christ. We may be afflicted, we may be struggling this morning, but there is a Christ who has prevailed on our behalf and has his hand in our lives and strengthens us moment by moment. Secondly, there's people. Christ is not in isolation from his people. He is bound to them. And that's the two points I want to look at this morning. John here in chapter 14 says, in effect, in verse 1, Behold, look at Christ. I saw and behold the Lamb standing on the mount. And he is saying to us, look to Jesus Christ in your battle. Look up and trust him and call upon him for he has pledged to care for you and to strengthen you. And there's a great contrast here set out in the passage. Chapter 12 talked about a, ra a dragon, but he's overcome by a lamb. And that lamb is none other than the one who is dis displayed in chapter 5 where we are told he is authorized to open up the scrolls of human history and that he receives the praise of God's people because he has released them from the power of Satan and he has redeemed a multitude which no man can number. And so all of heaven resounds in praise to the victory of Jesus Christ. And it says, look to Christ, behold, I saw the Lamb. Where are your eyes this morning? As you face challenges, do you seek the Lord to say, oh, lift my eyes to see reality beyond the reality that I see here on this, in this world and in my experience? May I know that I belong to a Christ who is going to win the victory. And not only does it say that he's a lamb, but it says something about his posture. He's a lamb who is standing, and he is the lamb, not a lamb. He is the lamb of God, and he is standing. What does that mean? Posture is important in the Bible, even when it comes to prayer. The old saints used to get down on their prayer bones until they couldn't get down there anymore. You understand what I'm saying? These things are important. We talk about the lifting up of the hands and so on. But here is our Lord. He is standing. Ordinarily, we think of Christ as seated at the right hand of God the Father. But in this case, he is standing. In his being seated, he is enthroned, he is received into heaven, he is granted all authority, but when he stands, he's exercising the authority. He's ruling over all circumstances. And not only that, do you remember the vision of Stephen, where he, being martyred for the faith, lifts up his eyes to heaven and he sees Christ receiving him and welcoming him home. And John is saying to us by the Holy Spirit, in all of your afflictions, look up to Jesus. Look at his posture. He's standing, he's ruling over the authorities, he's ruling over the circumstances. He's ruling over life, he is bringing about his kingdom and his love into the lives of his people for whom he died. He's standing. He's receiving us. But we go on to a third aspect. Where is he standing? On Mount Zion. He's home. 
Mount Zion in the Old Testament was the place where God was dwelling. Jerusalem specifically, and then the temple. But he dwells everywhere. And there is a special place, we may call it that, where he dwells in the heavenlies and Christ has been enthroned and received into Mount Zion, and there he stands as our representative and our Savior, appointed by God the Father for redemption and for the salvation of God's people. There's another thing that's pointed out in the text, and I'm just simply going through this very quickly. These, there's the people, and where are they? They're standing with him. That is so critical. You know, I, I have heard comments like this. Well, there was one man who was good enough to be raised from the dead. Now, I don't quibble with that statement, but they detach the reality of one man from all others. And they say, oh yeah, one man went ahead and he achieved a victory over death and so on. Let me tell you, our Lord did not do his work in isolation. He did not do it alone. He did it thinking of us. We were written upon his heart. And when he went to that cross, it was for his people. And there is an element of sharing that comes out of this passage. We are standing with Christ in his victory, and we receive his reward. We share in his inheritance. We share in the endless life that he grants we share in joy and the everlasting presence. We stand with him. And how many? 144,000 are standing. And we say, oh my, what does that mean? And it's a good question. Because a lot of people have got themselves into trouble over that number. You think of what the Jehovah Witnesses have done with that number. They believe that there's a special group of people who early on made it. They achieved heaven in some way, and they will receive heaven eternally in the presence of God. But the rest of the Jehovah Witnesses that are excluded from the 144,000 will have to live out their eternal days on the earth. And they are second grade citizens, if you please. And John has nothing like that in mind. There are no second rate citizens in the kingdom of God. We are equally sinners, but we are equally forgiven. We are equally righteous before the Father. We equally belong to the Father. And so that is the point that is being made. All of God's people are one. And that number 144,000 really represents the whole of God's people redeemed through Jesus Christ. It's a number that comes out of chapter 7 of Revelation. And there you have 12 tribes listed, and each tribe has 12,000, and that adds up to 144,000. But that number is typical. It's a, it's a metaphor of some sort, because you see that number even in chapter 7 morphs into a multitude which no man can number. And where do they come from? Just Israel? No. 
from the nations, from every tribe and tongue and nation. And what John is saying here to you and to me is this, that not one of God's children will be lost, and not one of his elect children from the foundation of the world will be missing, for each and every one have been redeemed through Jesus Christ. And that redemption, shall I put it this way, it was successful. It actually redeemed. And it wasn't a potential redemption. A hope for redemption. It was a redemption that said, these are mine, I have put away their transgressions and sins forever, and they are my possession. And they will not be lost. Every one that the Father has given to me will be saved. And John is writing to the church in all of his trouble with a dragon lashing out against it. Chapter 13 talks about a beast from out of the sea, a beast from out of the land. It's an awful picture. But keep your eyes on Jesus and see the connection he has with his people. They're redeemed, and they are hopeful, and they are promised the presence and dwelling place of God. Well, there's one other thing that I want to point, no, two other things, and then I will close for this morning. There's an interesting statement here. These people are singing, they're a choir. I'll mention something about that maybe in the second hour. But that choir, that 144,000, that innumerable multitude of people who have been redeemed from Jesus Christ, stretching from early on, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right on to the last soul for whom our Lord will win in time. Every one of them has a mark on their foreheads. Their name, the name of the Father, the name of the Son, is written on their foreheads. You know that there's a contrast being developed here. Chapter 13 ends with a persuasive, propagandist-type beast, a beast that takes the deceit and lies of Satan and peddles them as truth and leaves the world in a state of deceit. And everyone who follows the agenda of that beast has the mark of the beast, the name of the beast on them. And I'll leave it at that, but you've got a contrast. There is a mark on those who are ungodly. And there is a mark of Jesus Christ and the Father on the foreheads of those who belong to him. And you will look at each other this morning and you'll not see a literal form mark on the forehead, but you will see something of the gracious nature of God. You will hear something of the testimony of God's people as they speak to one another about their only hope in life and in death, and so on. The people of God are marked. And you know, when it comes to hearing sermons, one of the marks of a child of God is they say, oh, I understand that. I receive it. And you see, all of these things that are our possession that we share in Christ are sealed to us by the Holy Spirit. And he is indeed the seal and the mark in our lives. Well, there's one other thing I want to point out, and we conclude. First, we look up to Jesus. 
and we see that he's standing as a lamb, the lamb, who takes away the sins of the world. We see him with all authority, and he is in the presence of God, Mount Zion. And then we look at the people they share in his wealth, in what he has earned for us. We share in the fact that he's not disconnected or away from us, but is with us. And then we go on to understand that he has marked us out by the Spirit, and all of this is traced to a purchase price mentioned in verse 3 and in verse 4. And they sang a new song, verse 3, before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders. And no one can learn the song except the 144,000. And, and you have to listen to this. Who had been redeemed from the earth. They were purchased to God. And then in verse 4, toward the end of that verse, these have been purchased from among men or from mankind as first fruits to God and to the Lamb. I don't know how that strikes you. Your purchased property. And the Father in heaven has not bypassed you. He has said, Son, I give to you the names of my people. And the Son says, I receive those names and in agreement with the Father, Son, and Spirit. He comes to purchase a people for God's glory and for our consolation. And all we can do in a very real sense is just to say, oh, thank you, Father. Thank you that you have purchased me and brought me away from the dominating power of sin. You have broken that, and you have reconciled me to yourself as my Father in heaven. I stand before you in the righteousness of Christ. We're going to the table, but may all of this somehow be brought together and strengthen us in faith, for truly we are in the hands of a faithful Savior who loved us and gave himself for us. I start, I end where I started. This is the good news. We have Christ. He's the faithful witness. We have Christ. He is the firstborn from the dead. We have Christ. He rules over the kings of the earth. We have Christ. He has freed us from our sin with the shedding of his own blood. We have Christ. He has made us into a kingdom before the Father that we may serve him as priests forever. And we have a great hope in Christ. He is coming again. That supper declares my body was broken. My blood was shed. I am coming again. Let us pray. Our Father and our God, we give over to you these words that have been spoken and strengthen us. May we know that we are in Christ, safe, loved, that in spite of all that may happen to us and around us, you are the ruler of all things. 
and that there is love and mercy and kindness and patience in the way that you rule for the sake of your elect. And we thank you that in the end, you are bringing us home where we shall forever share in the inheritance. Blessed be your name. Amen.